Yeah. Okay, Henny, can I go? Right, good morning, everyone, and thanks, thanks for the great turnout, and good to see a whole bunch of new faces, and hopefully we'll be seeing more of you. just want to say you're almost welcome to come to the breakfasts. Um, it won't break the bank, and you're equally welcome, you know, to come to these presentations. And then one of the things we will be doing more of in, in the year are, are a couple of field trips, including day trips. We had a wonderful one to the Southern Cape over three days a couple of weeks ago. Jean Milan is here. And um, credit to him for taking us to some exceptional geology. And I should add, all of it was, was readily accessible. You know, we didn't have to climb mountains and jump down cliffs. So, you know, we cater for young and old, right? So this morning, we're going to have a, a talk from Peter Fenikirk. He's a local. He lives here in Onrus. Um, he's a wonderful resource, like many of the people we have in this town with, with great experiences in water. We all know that water, without water, there's no life, there's no growth, there's no food. And so it, it's absolutely critical, you know, that we look after this liquid stuff, um, aside from the fact it helps our whiskies and that. So Peter, Peter gave a, a very good presentation in uh, 2011. And, and this is really an update of that. And it's going to be fascinating to see what he has to say today. Um, in terms of his career, it culminated in him being in charge of the planning of all the water resources for South Africa and, and acting as a water diplomat, negotiating with South Africans' neighbors as regard shared water matters and resources. He holds two master's degrees, degrees, one from Stellenbosch and one from Stanford University in California, and a PhD on hydrologic economic appraisal of interbasin water transfer projects, which in a sense, I guess, is what he'll touch on today. Since retiring in 2013, he has had a small consultancy focused on assisting locally with community projects. And he chairs the Hermanus Borehole Monitoring Committee. You all know that 30% and it's growing of our water comes from our amazing aquifers at the base of these big mountains. Um, and so he's involved in that project. And somewhere along the line, I will have some more information and talks on that. So thanks, Peter. Over to you. Thank you, John. And thanks to John's persuasive powers, I'm standing here today. Fortunately, he didn't ask me to give you a piano recital. I'd rather do something that I'm more familiar with. As he said, I gave this, I gave a talk to U3A 11 years, near 12 years ago, and I had a revisit of that talk um, a few months ago, and I updated it. So for those of you that were at that meeting, unfortunately, this is much of a repeat of what you've heard there, uh, but I've put in a few other uh, additional slides. So um, on to the talk. This was the uh, title of the previous talk that I gave to U3A in 20, sorry, 2012, not 2011. Um, even in those days, there were all these, um, uh, headlines in the newspapers, regularly making the headlines about water crises. My talk is more focused on water resources. Of course, there are crises as far as water quality is concerned, as the management and local authorities are concerned. I'm talking more national water resources. So that's where I focus today as well. But these were the kind of headlines that we regularly saw then and that we still continue to see today. So. Uh, just to point out that <clears throat> almost always, every year, there is a drought somewhere in South Africa. And I'll just run through a, a sliver of history just to show <coughs> and everything that is in red is where a drought occurred in that particular year. This was in the uh, hydrological year, 1971. Uh, and so it carries on for the next few years. And you see there are droughts. And people complain, the moment there's a drought, they complain, they run to the ministers, they toy toy these days. 
This is now a similar kind of a picture of a slide, but it shows that uh, in, a, in a different way, just for the Western Cape, from the last 70 years, or actually from 20, 1929 to 2019, so it's more than, it's 90 years, there were a drought period here in the 30s, and then better years until the 70s. And actually, until we reached this huge drought that we had fairly recently in the Cape, the so-called um, day zero drought, this 1970s drought was the one that was used for designing water resources for the Western Cape. Incidentally, that happened also be the time that I was at university, so that's why we were more on Bikini Beach than in the classroom. <laughs> this is the good weather. So, um, South Africa, you all know, and especially the, the geographers amongst us, that South Africa is a land of extremes. We have floods and the droughts that I've shown about. We are spatially and temporally, it's the favorite words that these people use. From east to west, we have uh, reduced rainfall and therefore reduced runoff, but also much greater evaporation uh, to the so you, very dry conditions on the on the western seaboard and, and much more temperate and subtropical on the eastern seaboard. Um, our areas of national economic significance are spread out as you see there Gauteng counts for almost 50 percent of South Africa's uh, gross pr uh, product generated in that area. It's on the plateau. It's very difficult to provide with water. Water is, of course, as John has said, essential for any development. Um, and these are the areas that are then served by water systems. And we'll go into that now. Uh, the, another point of significance is that Many of our river basins are actually shared with neighboring countries. So we have this large area in, uh, what is the color there? <laughs> uh, this is yellow on my screen, but this area is the Orange River Basin, shared with uh, Namibia and Lesotho and also Botswana. Uh, we have the Limpopo Basin, that one there, shared with Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and then the Inkumati Basin shared with Swaziland and Mozambique and the Usutu Basin just below that uh, also with Swaziland and Mozambique. So the moment you start doing anything in these basins like building, wanting to build a big dam or so, you have to negotiate and, and get agreement with your co-basin states that you may do something there. Uh, and there are international agreements and there's even a UN convention that uh, lays down the kind of law, how to deal with these things. Um, so just to focus now on the Val River system, which supplies that heartland, economic heartland of Gauteng. This is the situation in 1940. Uh, there was one big dam on the Val River, which was the Val Dam, basically supplying water for irrigation downstream. Uh, in those days, that is the picture of the Val Dam. This is a later picture of the Val Dam. After it was raised, it was actually a much lower dam at that stage. And that was how Joburg looked like in those days, uh, fairly small. Uh, after that, more and more power stations were built, uh, mostly on the Mpumalanga Highfelt. Uh, Blumhoff Dam was built downstream of Val Dam to relieve Val Dams from, to, to be able to supply uh, more the urban areas uh, through ran water, and we'll get to that, the Gauteng. Blumhoff Dam then took over the irrigation downstream. Up on the escarpment was built Sterfontein Dam, which was filled by pumping water from the Tugela. Uh, together much lower, almost a thousand meters uh, 
head to pump over into the Stackfontaine Dam. And that water just sat there as a security, as, a, as water mm -hmm. for a rainy day, an old not so rainy area at the time. Um, so by the 1980s, the, the situation looked quite more complex than what it was in 1940. Uh, you see that uh, in the, this little picture at the left, you see the basins in South Africa with, that were now linked. Uh, this was then the old ball, ball system, but instead of just Vol Dam, we have Blumhoff Dam that came in there. We had the Tugela Basin with its dams there and pumping over into Stadfontein Dam. We had the Sutu Basin and the Komati Basin. These, as I said earlier, they flow into Swaziland and further on to Mozambique. But those, there were dams built there to bring water to these power stations that were built in the Olifants Basin, which is in the Pumalanga uh, High Felt, uh, where all the coal is, and that is why. And then, of course, a lot of uh, infrastructure to supply then into Gauteng from the Vol Dam. So the cities grew uh, after that. The old uh, uh, Sassel II at uh, Secunda. Uh, more water was required. In the Sutu Highlands first phase was built, which consisted of Katse Dam and Mohale Dam. And we'll get back to those again. And that was the picture by 2011, even more complicated, showing at the bottom here, if I get this, the Mohale Dam there. Katze them there, Mohale linking to Katze, there are other linkages and the water coming through to the Vol Dam. And this also showed in the next phase, which is Podihadi, it's, that's how they pronounce it in Lesotho. They pronounce sometimes the L's as a D. And so it's not Polihali, but Podihadi in, in Lesotho. So uh, that then is then the Vol system that must be um, operated, managed, because sometimes it, there's more water in one resource than in the other, and optimally utilized. Maybe more water has to be pumped from it together, or more water released from Lesotho, or whatever. So that is, there, there is a sophisticated systems. In fact, South Africa was at the forefront in the world on these systems modeling, modeling. and uh, uh, these are still being used today. Uh, the, these models were built in the, in the 1990s um, and, and, and upgraded afterwards. So this is again a picture, oh, sorry, I'll go, go up. Similar systems are for other economic areas in South Africa, Etiquity, uh, uh, Western Cape, Cape, Cape area. This is just an example. Uh, we looked at what would be the further resources that had to be developed, uh, options of supplying water. This was in 1999, huge arguments at that time about what the next phase should be. We wanted to go for the Burger River Dam. Um, the, there was a, a, big lobby against any further dams in, in, in the Western Cape. But eventually the, the dam was built. Um, our, our minister, Ocada Asmo, walked around with this document in his bag for five years before he signed it. Um, it's being, being so worried about, about the lobby. So this is the kind of thing that that was done or is typically still done. Uh, on the left hand scale is the requirement in the Western Cape. And you, you see here, this blue line was at the point as we projected how the requirements will grow over time, time being on the bottom axis. Oops. And different scenarios, this scenario envisaged that there will be a reduction in available water as a result of climate change. It's just a scenario. It wasn't, it wasn't the only scenario. It showed here at, uh, at a point 
Burglar Dam will kick in and it will increase the available yield uh, up to that point, which is higher than the requirement. So then the cape would be right for a while until the blue line crosses there. And then the next option has to come in. As it turned out, some of these options were also to reduce the water requirement uh, by doing what is called water conservation and demand management. So that was actually quite uh, effective. And the purple line, I hope it's purple on your, this line here is the actual use at the time. So by 2010, the actual use was over there. And we said, well, actually that first scenario was perhaps too high and we, we took the bottom blue line as you see there and then postulated further, further options like another dam, uh, um, using groundwater, um, reuse of, of effluent, treating it back to, to uh, potable water quality, uh, raising Stenbras Dam, using groundwater from the Cape Flats Aquifer. <coughs> and then lastly, uh, the, 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 well, not lastly, but the end one was then desalination. These, these were chosen in that sequence because of cost of water, desalination being far more expensive than the other options. So that was the, the, the planning that was done at that stage. Um, as I said, it's, still is continuing. Now what happened now? Okay, so I'll, I'll come back to that again. Uh, but uh, since the, the millennium, the, the, the day zero drought, the water demand has de decreased tremendously in the, in, in the Cape, and this all had been, has been sh shifted out. And, but those same scenarios are, are being followed up on. And as you may know, the, the Table Mountain sandstone groundwater aquifer, especially in the area of Stenbrus Dam, is actively being, being, uh, being pursued now by, by Cape Town. So we're now going to get to the Lesotho Islands water project, which uh, is there to augment water to Gauteng. Uh, so the, the treaty was signed in 1986. And after that, the whole project started. And as you see there, those were the, the, the uh, purpose, well, that was the purpose or the, the, the objectives of the Lesotho Highlands Water Project. Um, this slide just shows it, the, the, the project actually was originally envisaged in the 1950s when Ninam Shand, and in those days there were no other vehicles than, than getting onto a horseback and going right up there into the mountains. It started with the idea of the so-called Oxbow water scheme. Maybe some of you have heard of that before. And it gradually developed over, the, over time. <laughs> uh, and, and this gives a timeline. And here, in, and as I said, in 1986, the treaty was signed. So it was a much larger scheme than the original Oxbow scheme, uh, envisaged quite a number of dams into the future. And the, the actual project was started and by uh, 96, um, 97, the, the Katze Dam was completed and a few years later, Mohale Dam. And the water was then supplied from, from, from the, that being the first phase. So that is just a, a bit of a timeline. So phase one was then Katze Dam. Uh, and, I, and they're giving these statistics there, which you can read for yourselves. Um, there was a hydro plant also established, the Muela, uh, for use of Lesotho. Lesotho uh, is 72 megawatts. Uh, and I think it's been upgraded to 80 megawatts later by uh, some adjustments. Um, and extensive tunneling through the basalts and through the sandstones. Uh, the 
the livery tunnel being the one that comes out in South Africa near Clarence. Um, <clears throat> the livery tunnel mostly was in, in sandstone. Uh, the uh, transfer tunnel of 45 kilometers uh, in basalt. Um, and and uh, it was partially lined, but in the end, a lot of extra lining had to be done. And the, similarly with the with the um, Moale Dam, the next also bringing in uh, well, bringing in additional uh, yield. Uh, there you can see the statistics of Moale Dam. Um, also, long tunnel, also with its its uh, problems in the basalt, and I think Henny knows a lot about that. Maybe. I'm, I'm sure in the audience here and online too, maybe we can talk about the, those issues later. So, and then there was a smallish diversion from Matsuku River with a tunnel through to Katsi Dam to also capture the Matsuku River uh, to bring that into Katsi. So, the, the total yield there was in the order of 26 cubic meters per second um, averaged over, over, over the year at a, at a uh, sufficiently uh, secure um, rate. So I've mentioned the Muella Hydro Power Station just shows you a, 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 a section of the, that, the, the tunnel from Katze coming in from the right, and then you have this whole uh, tunneling and, and, and shafts uh, to, to bring the water through the uh, power station and then the tail race tunnel out to the Muela Dam. And from then onwards, water is taken out through the delivery tunnel to South Africa. <clears throat> this is what it looks inside. You see the the generators there, the uh, wheel uh, impellers below. Uh, so there's a map showing where these dams are, Mohale, Katsi, and then in the future Podihadi, and then where this Moela in, in the north is, and then onwards the north, uh, the tunnel to the uh, I'll show a similar picture a bit later as well. This is just uh, before the, the, I mean, this is where the action now is taking place. But just to give you an idea of the topography up there in Lesotho, um, you can almost build a dam anyway. So you, 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 you choose a point for, for other reasons as well. Um, uh, access uh, and linkages. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, those types of infrastructure that are required to, to, to put a project like that in place. I included this because what we found is that if you build another dam in Lesotho, and this is now the Podiari Dam, it will reduce the water that is already being used by irrigators downstream in the Orange River, and also the environmental requirements at the Orange River mouth. So not all the water can be used from the Podiadi Dam before you build a replacement dam at a lower site. One of the sites is right down at the Strip. Not a very good site, quite wide as you see there, but that is one of the options. Uh, it can only go up to a certain height before you uh, flood a little settlement further up in the valley. And this is just upstream of where you cross over to Note River in, in Namibia. Uh, so, but there are other options as well that are being looked at. So that will still, uh, so a replacement dam is also required. So just back, um, this is a bit clearer a picture of a, a map showing where Podiadi Dam is, 164 meters high with its tunnel going through to Katsi. Then the water that is then in Katsi then goes 
along with the existing tunnels, which thankfully are, will be large enough to take this extra flow for, uh, through to South Africa. Um, there was a huge argument, and I, I say an argument, there was, Lesotho very much wanted to double their power station at Mumela, saying, oh, now there's more water coming, so we want to make more electricity. And, but those systems analyses that we did, that I referred to earlier on, those sophisticated models, showed us that you would actually just drain Kodihadi Dam to generate electricity for Lesotho. And it would not increase the security of supply to South Africa. And so there was a lot of toing and froing. They even brought in consultants from Sweden to check our work. But in the end, they all agreed with us. And the idea was then uh, taken off the tail. Uh, and I'll come back. Lesotho still wants to do something to improve their, um, their, their power generation. I'll come back to that in a, in a short while. So this is an aerial view of Podi Dam. The, uh, the, this is the lake, the water. Uh, it, it is in the Senku, Senku River, which is basically what the orange is called in, in the Sudu. If, because there is, the water will spill over into the valley to the, to the west or to the right, uh, as you see it, with the water flows in, in the, to the bottom of the, of the, of the picture. Um, this, the, a saddle dam is also required, otherwise the water will just spill over into that little stream that you see there on, on your left hand side. Um, I'll show you more in this. This is now more detail about the actual works that are going to be, be built or are being built at the moment. Um, the main embankment is shown there. The saddle dam, as we've shown, the spillway on, I don't know if it's very clear to you, but the, you see the, the arrow there, there's a spillway. So it's a shoot, shoot spillway, but much like that Mohale uh, uh, dam shoot that we've shown earlier. Upstream, yeah, is a is a is a coffer dam. It's a, it's a dam that's built in order to divert the water of the river while the dam is being built. Uh, let me just. I'll just carry on. Okay, they show the quarries. The quarries for the dam itself, because the dam is a concrete faced rock full dam, so the volume of the dam is basically the rocks that are uh, compacted, uh, sorry, and, and these are all the rock full quarries. And then there's also a quarry there higher up uh, for, for concrete aggregate. Um, I just want to point out that there's a, not only this, um, this, this diversion structure here, but there's also one here that is incorporated into the wall of the dam. And these are the diversion tunnels that come through uh, that then lead the river out of the way so that you can construct the dam inside the area that is secured by these, these two, two uh, little dams. So that's the diversion works. Now, this is a cross-section of the main embankment. As I said, it's a concrete-faced rockfall dam. So the face is this black line here in front. It looks like a very thin layer, but it's, it's, it's a probably half a meter to a meter thick. Uh, there's a lot of complicated work required to seal the dam. Uh, on that side, and then the rest is basically behind it. It's just rock, 
rock that is uh, excavated, as I've shown from these quarries, and being compacted in layers like that. Um, 164 meters high in total. And uh, you'll see the volumes there, 12 million cubic meters of, of rock. Um, okay. All sorts of other infrastructure has to be built, uh, such as roads and, and bridges. This is the diversion tunnel again being, being constructed and it is actually now completed. You may have seen that President Ramaphosa went there the other day and they, he uh, had his blanket around him and all the other people with their blankets, they were uh, officially opening uh, the works here. Um, so now the tunnel that is going to be built from Fordiardi to Katsi, the 38 kilometer tunnel, five meter diameter. It, uh, it will have two um, tunnel boring machines working from both sides. What is interesting is that although it is in basalt, they have now taken the decision to line the whole tunnel by pre-manufactured segments, concrete segments that they bring in, in the same way that they did it with a delivery tunnel into South Africa from Moela, which was basically in sandstone, which was the reason why they wanted to do it that way. It was very successful and they didn't have the trouble afterwards that they had with the other tunnels uh, going through the basalt. I understand the basalt here is not of a very good quality. They worried about being quite close to the sandstone and therefore not of the same quality as the basalt uh, higher up. At an interesting feature is how do you link in with at Katsi Dam? And we had a, a consultant with us that actually came from uh, Iceland, and he suggested the so called Norwegian lake tap method. The Norwegians apparently have done that hundreds of times in Norway with linking into their fjords with their hydropower. It has also been applied in other, on other continents, in the US, etc., but not on a, on a large scale. And I believe this will be the first time in Africa where you have the tunnel coming in lower than the, the lake level or the level of the dam. You have to put in a, a, a gate uh, and it will be clear to you why after, after this. You, you dig a hole there below the level of the tunnel and you prepare that area there to be blasted like you see here in the enlargement. And then you go and blast it and it falls in like that and you connect it. A tricky operation. And I believe they're going to get a Norwegian expert to come and, uh, and, and do that. That's a subcontract of the main tunnel contract. So you do that while it's working in the dam? Yes. <laughs> That's why you need that, that gate. <laughs> you, don't want, you don't want the whole tunnel to be flooded all of a sudden. <laughs> But you probably will take everybody out just in case before the time. So advanced infrastructure is what they call all these other stuff that have to be in place. The roads, the bridges, the, uh, the housing for staff, for, for workers, uh, telecommunications, power. This all is a substantial part of the total cost, probably about a quarter of the total cost if not more, uh, of, of, of uh, just getting those things in place. Um, so that is all under construction at the moment and quite advanced. So that as a, just a picture again of to show what the conditions and what the topography is in that area, how, where you have to build roads, not the same as in the free state. <laughs> 
this is, you see the, the old roads on the left there, which basically Basuto pony tracks, and then, then, uh, then the new road going there. Uh, that's a typical, this is an existing bridge, but uh, this is the kind of bridge that will be required, a number of them, I think two or three. Uh, quarries, we've spoken a bit about them. There, there they are being opened up. Uh, okay, now I mentioned to you that Lesotho is still keen on their upgrade of their, their electricity. They don't, for some other reason, they don't trust South Africa's power supply. <laughs> so uh, they, they have gone back to the old Oxbow uh, position of the Ox, the, and it's called, and that, that is what they now investigating very seriously. They're doing a, uh, the, you know, there's stages of planning, with, uh, and uh, one of the last stages is your feasibility study. So um, this is where it is. And you can see in relation to our tunnels, there's the Katze Dam and the tunnel going through to Moela there. So they want to build a dam there at Oxbow and a power station about there and the water will then flow into that little river there, which is where the Moela Dam also uh, links into. Um, so it will be a hundred meter high dam uh, with a 720 meter gross head. That's the level difference to, to give, to generate the electricity. And they want to install 80 megawatts, which basically will double their hydro power facility. Uh, sorry, that is the wrong way. And that is just uh, a, a bit more detail of the the long section at the bottom of our, and they're looking at different routes. They're thinking of the penstock as being an up above ground steel, steel penstock, which visually wouldn't be very nice. I think maybe economic. Uh, the jury is still out on what they're going to do there. Um, so, uh, Back to the Lesotho Highlands place two. Sorry, sorry, the, the pale race. Uh, the penstock, sorry, penstock is the, let's go there. You'll have your power station right at the end. And from the power station, you'll have a, you'll have a tunnel or a pipeline taking water to the river that you call the tail race. But the actual pipe coming in under high pressure, you must contain that high pressure up to the, to the power station. That is called the penstock, okay? <clears throat> so what they, and that's a good question. You try and not have high pressures for the bulk of the way because that makes it very expensive. And also it can lift, if it's, it can hydraulically jack, if you don't have enough of an overburden, it can jack up the, your, your uh, rocks above you, the rock. So you tunnel it uh, in such a way that you do not have high, uh, not very high pressures, but then at a point you have to drop it down. And that is where the high pressures are. So then, that is why they're thinking of making that in steel and putting it above ground, which then has certain advantages. But as I said, it's not, that wouldn't look very good. But that's that's. Um, but otherwise, you have to go down like the Edmuela in the rock, going down, and then horizontally into your into your power station, tunneling and shafting and tunneling, and that'll be the pin stop. Okay, so the yield of Lesotho Highlands when, in, when the um, phase two is in would be 40.3 cubic meters per second. The completion, when we completed the, the feasibility study and, and we did our systems analysis and projections, we said by 2019, it has to be in, otherwise, 
the risks for Gauteng would become too high beyond this sort of normal serviceable level of, of, of water supply. So it is not in yet. It, the target date now is 2029, but the growth didn't happen, which was then fortuitous in a sense because of economic slump uh, in South Africa that you all know about. <clears throat> but nobody at that point knew that that was going to happen, that the, that the, the demand was going to, to, to also slump. So there were these repeated delays and the delays were due to all sorts of extraneous political and administrative factors, such as alleged interference by the Minister of Water and Sanitation. Here's a Daily Maverick a clip uh, that, that said that uh, the minister wanted her own consultants to come on board. Uh, she wanted a company that nobody, nobody knew about, well, not in, in our circles, LTE Consulting, fee estimate of 2.6 billion. This is now taken from, uh, from Daily Maverick, et cetera. That was even, even at that time, LTE Engineering was already subjected to a probe by the Special Investigating Unit and a probe by the Public Protector in 2016. The RSA chief delegate to the um, Pasuto Highlands Water Commission, sitting there in Masuru and looking after our interests of the project, she was against the, the appointment of this, of this irregular appointment. So she was promptly removed by the minister. Um, so today, the whole thing is delayed. And uh, I understand it's largely due to these political interferences, but also slow approvals within water affairs and the new requirements from financial institutions and contractual issues with roads. So the completion date, yeah, was 2028. I've now read it's 2029. The costs increased from 1.3 billion US dollars to 2.2 billion US dollars, uh, largely due to these delays. So um, I've shown you earlier with the Western Cape, the Vol River systems, uh, also scenarios. This was a, a scenario with um, Things like high target water conservation, demand management, desalination of mine water, and unlawful abstractions omitted, um, which are things that you don't really have a clue about now. But I, these are just to say they are different um, interventions that are required. And you hope that things like illegal abstractions will be eliminated. A lot of it, uh, farmers actually put their pumps into the water of the Lesotho Islands flowing down the, the Ash River and uh, pump it out. And, and you now these things have to be contained. So, so um, you'll see here on the left-hand side again, the water requirements. This is almost a factor larger than, than in the Western Cape. So it shows you it's, it's, a, it's a lot of water that we're talking about. And um, this was these, these lines going up, different projections of requirements, uh, depending how successful one is. And then the red showing where body hardy dams um, with the risk is, is, is too high. And now, and that was when body hardy dam was in, going to be in full, in, in fully operate rating in 2028, well, that's about right. So, so there'll be a number of years and we're already starting now that there is a, 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 a risk higher than, than what we actually would like to see uh, for Gauteng. Uh, so hopefully there will not be a drought, but if a drought like we've experienced in the Western Cape, similar sort of 
situations and people now talking about El Nino, who knows, uh, it, it, it can happen. So um, this was just, again, just to get back to the, the interference with issues. Um, in 2018, she left the department. Um, she, there were all sorts of other shenanigans, uh, you know, the, with, with her and Greasy and Zondo. She was mentioned a number of times there in the Zondo Commission. What happened to LTE engineering? They were liquidated in 2022, still being investigated by the Hawks. Uh, so in, when I gave my talk in 2012, I said, do we have a water crisis? At that time, we didn't know about, about all these issues that were lying ahead. Uh, I said, well, the, water, the quantity management of water resources at that point was still in a, in a fairly good shape. But there were orange lights flickering uh, uh, and to do with human resources, etc. Quality management largely in the local authority space is far more a question mark about. So in 2012, uh, for instance, I said that in 2000, there were 55 directorates in the department. By 2010, there were 125. So in 10 years, it increased by more than doubled, while the professional engineers reduced from 19A, but from 400 to 2012 to 87. So those directorates were not technical core directorates to do with water resource management or water with water management. It had far more to do with uh, more extraneous factors. Uh, and and uh, and the local authorities, the picture was very bleak already at that stage. Very f many municipalities without a single technical person. That situation, and there were issues about maintenance of assets. There were a lot, a lot of co concerns at that stage that were already raised, rearing their their heads. Uh, so the position of 2012. That, those concerns absolutely remains today or remain today. Uh, there now only a sprinkling of professional engineers and scientists left in, in, in local government and in water affairs, still a bit of technical quality, but decision-making has slowed down dramatically because that technical, the technical cadre is not represented in the top echelons any longer in the, in the de department. Uh, and there's a downward grade of uh, overall capacity. There was an infrastructure report by the South African Institute of Civil Engineers. Uh, they do it every number of years, looking at not just water infrastructure, but all infrastructure in the country, roads, bridges, everything. But specifically about water affairs, they say the capacity to implement and manage projects has reduced over the years and is now under extreme pressure. And over the last decade, there have been major loss of senior engineering personnel from the department, mainly due to the retirement of staff, currently more than 100 senior level engineering personnel. So uh, that is the good news. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Jagdish. Thank you, Jagdish. And that big quarry that was supplying rocks to the wall, is that purely uh, 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 the volcanic? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, it's a basalt. Yeah. They're not a weathering from I don't have that detail. I'm sure there are people in this room or online that can, can help there. But um, <clears throat> my understanding is that certain layers are of good quality. So they obviously will go for less of, what do they call it? Uh, they need amygdaloids or those, those white things that you see there in the basalts. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, I make dials. Yeah. What, what do you for? Yeah, a lot of the lagers are, in a sense, composite. They have uh, lots of bubbles at the top, um, the white amic dials. I'm sure everyone has been to the draft and to exceeds, and that tends to be, um, you know, disaggregates quickly and weathers quickly and it holds moisture. So, so, and, and then other parts of the lagers are, are very massive and coherent. So, if you can find those, you can use those. But that's why. Peter also pointed out that they are increasingly, and uh, so nowadays they line the tunnels. I think Henny and John, John Agar was at, you know, worked extensively on those tunnels yeah. and, and they were surprised over time to see the degradation of, of, of a lot of that basalt. You know, and, and as you imagine, you know, the water flow there is quite aggressive. And very interestingly, as Peter says, they now have that. Um, steel line sort of outside um you know tunnel in stock um, for that reason again it's probably more expensive initially but in the long term it's probably more cost effective okay. there's a question from the audience on zoom one reference to has the water protection going greater upside sorry has the water extraction become greater upside Upstream, upstream. upstream uh, it, it, look, are we not? If we talk about Lesotho, then then it is minimal. Uh, I mean, there is a, a very, very little growth in that part of Lesotho. Very low population. Uh, it, in, and, and similarly, really, in the Val River Basin, it, it, the Val River Basin upstream of the Val Dam, there is not huge growth. It, it may be more of a concern would be pollution from mining activities, but not uh, from, from urban growth uh, and, and not, not uh, water abstraction issues uh, upstream that will reduce uh, to any ex uh, serious extent the yield of the whole system. If I'd like you to do that, a question to come up to the front and so come up and point in the important jobs. I was lucky to you know, come and stand here and talk into the. Have you got a podium? Then? Mike is in here. Oh, Mike is here. Mike, 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 Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I was lucky enough to work on the Orange Fish Tunnel as a youngster. And later on in business, I was lucky enough to visit the Kotsi Dam just before completion. And we went into the dam and you go down a lift right to the bottom and there are tunnels that go out towards the intersection of the concrete with the rock. And there is a continuous, continu there was then and I should imagine now, a continuous program of grouting to ensure that if there's a physical movement or geological uh, shrinkage or whatever, the, the small leaks are caught in time. When I read Andre de Rey's book, I'm very concerned about the detail. Is that program of grouting of all of the dam walls, the concrete dam walls, ongoing and is it covered by the necessary skills? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's called repair and maintenance, and it's ongoing. <clears throat> Look, in, in South Africa, we have uh, a dam safety office. And because of exactly those concerns about the, the safety of dams, and they, they classify the dams according to the risk that the dam would pose, if anything really serious could go wrong with a dam. And the, the, the ones that are classified uh, in, the, in the upper echelon have to be regularly inspected and reported on. Uh, and the, the Department of Water Affairs must report on these, these inspections and uh, their findings. And that Happy states had been continuing until about 
2017, if, I'm, if my memory is, serves me right. And then it has actually stopped. So one of the things that this infrastructure car, uh, uh, by the South African Institute, uh, 2022 infrastructure assessment said is that that is a serious concern that the dam safety office is not reporting on the inspections and the findings, etc. The inspections are probably still happening, and some people, like Mr. Kuleski, and so they may be even still involved in that. But um, uh, but those things are not reported. So there is not really a handle on uh, the quality of work or whether it is done, done adequately. Now, typically, all big dams will have these, what we call galleries at the bottom, or maybe even at more than one level in the dam. And that is initially, as, as, as you've said, um, to especially the bottom gallery is for, for grouting because you have, you decide to grout up a grout line underneath the dam at a, on a certain line. But that grouting, uh, and behind that grout, you will have holes. And if you see water pushing up out of that holes and then the and water running out, then it may require additional work. But normally the grouting is, is done and then in the, the inspections will then carry on and hopefully there wouldn't be any further grouting required. But the inspections are of course important. Um, there are all sorts of other instrumentation also put into a dam like that, uh, depending on what sort of dam it is, whether it's a concrete dam like Katsi, picking up the movement of the dam. Uh, it actually moves a bit during temp due to temperature and water pressures, etc. See, that is all within the limits uh, that is predicted, uh, or hydro pressures inside the soil in a, in a earthfall dam, for instance. And that sort of, I mean, there are lots of these instrumentation in these dams to help assess the, 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 the safety and the risks to these dams. So I, in the case of the Sutu dams, these are under the, the, the structure of the Sutu Highlands Water Commission, which is a joint commission between South Africa and the Lesotho. And underneath is the Lesotho Highlands Development Authority. And they, uh, they, they have a strong structure to look after the two big dams, Mohale and, and Katse, and of course the tunnels as well. But the oversight is there. So that is in place. I wouldn't be really concerned about the, the dams. Yeah, you know, Peter, perhaps just another couple of other comments. I mean, there's also a lot of foreign money going into these projects. <laughs> and would imagine there's an oversight from the funders. We yeah. know there's been corruption, but there's almost certainly an oversight from these, those funders. The second thing we've talked about movement, you know, the pressures in these dams is enormous and, and you get seismic activity as well. Um, so I think they're also seismic monitors. Yeah, really. And you talk about the pen stops. I think if you drive to Cape Town, you'll see that big tower <laughs> just past um, what's a little town with the big yeah, yeah. 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 stop. No, you know, I think that's a pen stop and a surge chamber because on these pump storage dams, you run water down. You know, typically in the day when you need peak uh, peak period power. But at night, you then pump that water back up and, and you reverse those turbines and it goes back up at a hell of a rate to get it back up the hill. And so you need a surge chamber up there to effectively slow it down. So, you know, the engineering is, is quite spectacular. Credit to, you know, South African and international engineers. Peter, and there's a guy, is our painter's thanks for talking about area that he's been involved in. Yeah. Uh, he said one correction in the late 70s, the lake tap method, as you call it, was used to start tapping water from the mud pump there. 
Oh, you will balance that. Interesting. Well, Saki, I'm glad you're on <laughs> online. And on the pressure side again, the, the rubbery tunnel coming from Moella, the part of it has to be a steel line because of the very real possibility of the mountain being lifted, so to speak, mm -hmm. by hydrofraction. Mm -hmm. And the, the tunnel itself coming from, from the dam. And the reason why they're doing it fully lined down is they envisage to have that 45 kilometer tunnel without any concrete, but soon realize they were stuck and go retrofit and concrete that whole tunnel once it's been done, which is much more expensive than just lining it and pick up. Which is one of the main reasons why Poddy Honey is now being done fully lined as it is. But just on that, today, they also, I said two TBMs. Starting on each side and come, working their way to each other, each then 19 kilometers or something like that. And there's a factory on either end manufacturing these segments that they bring in. You, you showed a slide there of, of three guys standing in front of the TBM, two of my ex bosses. <laughs> also, two machines that's the one broke, so they broke through yeah. to each yeah. other. With something like two inches of difference between the other motions. That was pretty you know, accurate. It was that your fault. Yeah. 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 Is Andrew Tanner, and he had been involved since that 1985. He's been all his life involved in the Lissu Dialys project on the planning side for the first phase and on the second phase. Unfortunately, he's not online today, he's got some other obligations, but these have some of his information I've included in this talk. <laughs> I have nothing to add on this one here. Most of it I don't understand, but maybe I have to add something as far as water is concerned. And the numbers I give you are not mine. They are from the United Nations. 1%, 10% of 1%. That is what we as humans, including the dams, have available at, as water. 97% is seawater. And out of the 1%, 70% is irrigation, 20 is industry, and 10 is water for a whole. So what is the next logical step? Desalination, you mentioned the word twice or three times. For that, we need plenty of power, which we ain't got. That's in the reason why in the Middle East, desalination be now in the UAE or in, the, in Israel, Power is not an issue, it's available. However, there is an alternative, which I learned about quite a number of years ago. Desalination in a confined area for a confined quantity driven by wind power. It's almost off the shelf. And what it does is it produces around about 480,000 liters of water a day which throws around about 4,000, a community of 4,000 people. Since I can think back, and particularly PE, the Eastern Cape, oh, we have got a water problem. That has never changed. So the point I'm trying to make is, for smaller communities around the coast, there is a solution available to say, we can now provide water. The question came up and I was prepared for it anyway. If there is no wind, well, then there is sun. If there is no sun, 
well, there is no ESCOM, then we did ink on water. But the point is, for most of the time, we have alternatives available that will serve certain communities. And this comes to my mind right now. <clears throat> In the bad old days, and all this planning you showed us emanated from those days, we could, if we wanted to, pump desalinated water from Durban to Johannesburg, if we so wanted. We are not doing it because there's no desalination plant, but we can pump oil from the coast to Johannesburg. The point simply is, how important is fresh water for all of us? And that is what we should put our minds to and eventually talk about it. To say, yes, we can augment what we have got in our dams for the time being um, by other means. That's the point I tried to make. Mm -hmm. One more question from John Simone is that uh, why the emphasis so much still on surface water, where as opposed to groundwater, and makes a statement that if you go catchment wise mm -hmm. for fraction, start improving for fraction, so no release water would be your catchment and your dam. Wouldn't that be the way to go? And is there any focus on that? that you're aware of at the moment. Okay, I will have to defer to the geohydrologists, uh, and I'm sure there are people in this audience that know far more than I do, but it's what is different to South Africa from, say, the US uh, and the Northern Hemisphere is that apparently we didn't have that much of the, the ice ages that turned everything up. And we have a far more hard rock situation in South Africa. So our water is more in the interstitious, in, in, in little cracks and so, like here in the, in the Western Cape. We're basically looking at the Table Mountain group, uh, which it fortunately is a huge quantity of rock, but, and therefore there is quite a lot of water. But to get that water out of that rock, is, is very hard. Uh, there is the Cape Flats, which is more a, what we call a primary aquifer. But, you know, there's a lot of that. There are a few places up there in the north, uh, in, on the Sand River. Yes. Uh, but but there, are the, there are a few places. And then we have the Dolomites, where we, where we uh, have the cavities in the dolomites that they can uh, tap. But um, to a large extent, these things have been exploited. Things that haven't been exploited are these deep table mountain aquifers, but that is now what is now being aimed at. It is expensive, therefore it is not, it is cheaper to go for surface water and then at the, at the, at the, at the next phase to go for groundwater and then later, the desalination. William is quite correct that the coastal areas are obviously the first places to go for desalination because <clears throat> they're right there. Although, you know, if you speak to experts in desalination, they say to you it is actually quite hard to get that water from the coast to where it is actually put into your system because everything was designed to bring the water, say, to Cape Town from the Berg River or so. So now you have to put a desalination plant on the coast. You have to cross all the services and roads and pipelines and things with your bulk water to bring it into a big reservoir somewhere in the upper region. So it's not a question of just taking a hose pipe and putting it into, into the system here at the coast. That costs, the cost of getting rid of your to saline brine with brine and to link up is actually more in capital cost than to put in a desalination plant itself. So, and obviously, then the running costs are high because of the 
per, per consumption. But it is, it's a technology that is proved. In fact, we have done, a lot of people in the past said, we must go to the Zambezi River. There's a lot of water. We must just bring the Zambezi to stuff out there. We calculate it will be the same order of costs to take desalinated water at Richard's Bay or wherever, bring it to Gauteng, and to bring some busy water to South Africa. And then you don't have all the international problems that you have with some busy water. So, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's like the sense that you need, and we haven't discussed it, and someone needs to do it for us. I mean, the two other big issues is water management. I mean, to step back, 90% of, of fresh water is underground. So there's no shortage of it, but it gets back to water management and it gets back to pollution. And, and we all know that you know one of our biggest resources of water in Khateng, in the Dolomites, is heavily polluted. And and you know, heaven forbid we pollute our aquifers here in Hamanus. The Cape Flats aquifer has a huge problem with pollution, and a lot of it is sewage, untreated sewage, you know, and and um, and, and, and so, so very critical thing is how we manage our water. And you know, Peter's showing we have the expertise <laughs> and we had in the past to do amazing things with storage and movement of water. What's probably really missing now is management of that scarce resource. Anything else? Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Uh, you great show. Thanks, Peter. Thank you.